Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back, and uh, great to see everybody again this morning, or for the first time this morning for people who weren't here yesterday. Um, so uh, we're just going to get we're just going to go right ahead and get started with our first session for today, and uh, the moderator for that. So I'll introduce the moderator for that. It's Amanda Lewandowski, um, who is uh, currently a fellow with our well. Amanda has a long history with us. She was our student, and then now she's a, uh, a fellow at our um, Technology Law and Policy Clinic, uh, going off to a clinical faculty position, yay, um, but, uh, next year. So uh, Amanda will be the moderator for the first panel, and she'll introduce the speakers. Can everyone hear me OK? Great. Uh, thank you all for being here so bright and early. I'm so delighted to introduce you to our incredible panelists. Um, we will be starting off with Jeannie Frommer, who will be presenting her research on machines as the new Oompa Loompas, trade secrecy, the cloud, machine learning, and automation. And I'm so excited for Jeannie to present this work because this is not her first, you can come on up and get, come on over, um, to present her work on this because she's actually done other research in this area, including for the trade secrecy uh, in Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory chapter for a book that was co-edited by our own Kathy and Rochelle Dreyfus. So very exciting. She also had another previous history as a researcher doing machine learning and AI, which is why I'm so delighted to bring her up here and talk about her work. Thank you. So um, good morning. Um, I'm going to leave this alone before it falls on me. Um, so as Amanda noted, in 2011, I wrote a piece for Rochelle and Kathy's um, collection of chapters on trade secrecy, so trade secrecy in Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, and this came out of their great previous conference on trade secrets, so I'm delighted to have been both at the original and the sequel um, on this. And in um, that chapter, I wrote about how the plot of Roald Dahl's book, um, which was one of my favorites as a kid, was driven by trade secrecy, something I rediscovered when I was rereading the book with my son. And um, so let me just outline that, and you'll see how it's relevant, other than to just maybe wake you up a little bit on Saturday morning. Um, so what was going on in that book is you had Willy Wonka's competitors stealing secret processes of um, Wonka to make candy by sneaking in spies to work in his factory. And so it ultimately got so bad that Willy Wonka had to shut down his factory and fire all the employees that were working there. But the factory started up again mysteriously without any employees going in and out, and everyone was wondering what was going on there. And the golden ticket contest was such a big deal in the book because people wanted to see how the factory worked, especially without all the, these employees. What was going on there? No one was going in. And the winners discovered that the way the factory was working was that there were these Oompa Loompas that lived and worked there. And they were the perfect solution to Wonka's problem in the competitive space because two things. They never left the factory. They lived there. They were paid in chocolate, which they loved. <laughs> So they never took their secrets out into the world. I'm going to put aside the ethical <laughs> implications of all this for a moment. Um, and they looked unique. So no spies could no longer come in and be disguised as them. So they were the perfect solution um, to Wonka's problem. And so Wonka's secrecy of his candy making processes was really strong as a result. Um, perhaps too strong until he undermined himself by letting in the old golden ticket winners and letting them see everything that was going on. But that's another story. Um, okay, so why am I mentioning Oompa Loompas in the context of a conference on trade secrets and algorithms? Um, because I want to uh, make the case that today's machines and the algorithms within them are the new Oompa Loompas. And we ought to be worried about that. And I am going to argue that the incentives that trade secrets currently provide to develop these new Oompa are excessive and worrisome in relation to their effect on competition and follow on innovation by other people. So um, trade secrets, like other intellectual property rights, are in large part about providing Another incentive to innovate, in addition to or instead of patents, something I know um, that Nicholson is going to um, uh, 
be talking about, and it's also about commercial morality. We could put that aside for now or discuss that a little bit later. Um, but intellectual property rights, as Rochelle mentioned yesterday, are about providing rights that provide an incentive to create something socially valuable. But they're also about not going too far and hurting in the society in the process by creating excessively strong rights that impair follow-on innovation or competition. And Kathy and Rochelle each mentioned yesterday some of the internal limitations that trade secret law has to make sure that um, the rights that are provided are not too excessive. So let me just go over some of that because I'm gonna come back to some of this. So um, to have a trade secret, according to the law, you need to have any, pretty much any type of information um, that's secret, it's not generally known or readily ascertainable by proper means, that derives independent economic value from being secret and reasonable efforts are undertaken to keep it secret. And then um, you're in trouble for misappropriating if you either take it through improper means or you um, breach a confidence uh, or a duty that you owe to the trade secret holder. And then it's protectable as long as it remains a secret, which is potentially an infinite duration. Not always in practice, but it could be for quite a long time. And there are some important limitations on that that are baked into the law, either these definitions or that the law has, grown, has understood over time. So one, you could independently discover a secret. Then you haven't misappropriated any of your duties. You can reverse engineer to discover a secret as long as you've obtained the thing that you're reverse engineering properly. And um, the other important limitation is that um, in favoring employee mobility and putting a strong thumb on the scale for that, employees are allowed to leave a place where they were working on trade secrets and go work somewhere else as long as they're only using at the new place their, um, general, their unprotectable general knowledge and skill. Right? The, the courts have said the law does not require a, an employee to undergo a frontal lobotomy and to make them stay at a job, you know, frankly, that um, for the rest of their lives because they learn trade secrets there. And so each of these limitations, um, plus the limitations that are imposed by the affirmative requirements of trade secret law, once upon a time, and by that I'm really thinking about, let's say, in the 1980s until recent years, um, acted as a constraint on the strength of trade secret rights in the software industry. Um, and a lot, how so? So a lot of things in software were generally known or readily ascertainable, so they were never even secrets in the first place. Um, but generally the way things worked is the industry released software, which meant that you had object code, at least, and then you could reverse engineer that to some degree. Um, software started off a lot less complex than it is now, so reverse engineering was a um, relatively plausible thing, at least in approximating you know, an understanding of what software was doing. The other thing that's really important about the way the software industry worked, and I think we see this epitomized by how Silicon Valley was operating, is that employees had lots of tacit knowledge that they gained in the course of working for a software company, and there was a lot of movement of employees from one company to another. And in fact, that's been a um, strong theory of why Silicon Valley was so successful compared to other high-tech sectors is that California would not enforce non-compete agreements. And because of that, employees more readily moved from one um, company to the next, carrying their background knowledge with them. And Silicon Valley flourished because everyone had better information. So there was leakiness um, to um, the secrets to some extent. And in fact, in teaching the trade secrecy course um, that I've offered here, it's, you know, it's, uh, starting out early on, we barely talked about software cases um, because they were too hard to keep secret under this sort of understanding. They weren't prevalent at all in the trade secret space. But three things have changed and are changing in this industry in recent years. And I think they're undermining the three internal limitations on trade secrets. That, and they've made trade secrecy increasingly attractive in this space. Um, so the first thing I think that's changed quite a bit is cloud computing. So that's meant that um, companies don't have to release anything other than their user interface to the public. It means that it's just increasingly hard to reverse engineer. You don't have the object code. Um, to of software if, if something's coming out in that version. And so you, don't, there's not, you, do, you can't reverse engineer in the same way. Um, so it's easy to keep functionality um, available, but keep how it's happening 
um, off limits to the public. The second thing, and that's been most of our focus here, um, that's been a really important change, is uh, machine learning, the use of big data, the use of models, of course, and I think we've all just seen that through, you know, it's in, in the, um, in our work and in the talks yesterday about how that's meant that it's very easy to just keep things back. You keep the data back um, and um, you may even keep your model back in the cloud and it's just really hard to figure out what's going on. So, okay, so increasing use of secrecy on that um, lines. The other thing I'll mention, um, perhaps a little less relevant for our discussion today, but I think it wraps up what, uh, you know, some of what's going on in, in the software industry is um, the increasing use of automation. And so what that's meant and started to mean is you see starting to see some replacement of employees with machines. And with that going on, that means, um, you know, in total, so let me say, so, you know, you don't have machines that are moving from company to company to work necessarily. You put the, stick them in one place and they're like the Oompa Loompas, they're happy to stay there. So I think in general, you know, all of these three developments in the computing industry have meant that machines really are the new Oompa Loompas. They stay put, they stay hidden, and they stay happy um, behind closed doors. And, um, you know, they're fed by the company with electricity, data, they grow ever powerful, and, um, and that's what we see. And that's worrisome, um, because the incentive to rely on trade secrecy in this sector has become really strong. You can get the protection um, by having just about any information, as I said, um, taking reasonable efforts to keep it secret, which is easy to do with this, um, and, um, and not having to worry that it'll be generally known by others. And you also don't have to worry, on the other hand, that the trade secret will be destroyed too easily because it's too hard for someone else to independently discover or reverse engineer it. And to the extent that it's either off, it's off limits to an employee because it's all in a machine instead, or because employees don't understand necessarily what it is that it's doing, then they're not gonna be the mechanism carrying this information or aspects about this information to other businesses in the space. So trade secrecy is really attractive in a way that it hadn't been um, in the past in the sector. And um, whenever you know, something, an incentive becomes attractive, uh, an IP incentive becomes attractive, we have to, I think it's really important to ask whether the businesses need such a strong incentive or whether it's too strong and it undermines innovation um, that the law is trying to promote. And I fear that it is. So, Follow on innovation given the lockup of data and the network effects that flow from growing a better model, the more you have good data, um, seem to be undermined. And some of what we discussed yesterday are about the worrisome effects on competition um, from the space. And so the question is will there be enough incentives for others to innovate? That's the incentive question I'm particularly worried about in this context. Will there be enough incentives for others to innovate in the face of an initial mover's trade secret? And I worry that the answer is no because the, with the advantage they get from being the first one out and getting the data that they need to start building up their um, uh, model and whatnot is just going to be too strong of a deterrent effect on others given that it's too hard to enter the space. And the software industry, it's important to note, was viable in the absence of trade secret protection for um, a long time. And an important question is whether the industry, in light of these tra changes, really needs trade secret protection, or does it just like it? Because it's highly protective. And I suspect a lot of it is the latter, um, but it's very hard to know, right? The industry has changed, so we really have to be evaluating is this something they need at all in order to innovate. Um, software industry was very low protection for a long time, and they flourished, right? And the question is, is that, um, can that still be the case? Figuring out even what to do about this is really hard. Because even if you remove trade secret protection, it allows people to keep things as actual secrets. And that might mean they're investing lots of resources in trying to protect the actual secret, which is socially wasteful. Although it's social waste that I'm actually somewhat attracted to in this context, because if you could say it detracts, if, if it takes away from these movers' resources, um, then perhaps they're just, you know, leveling, the helping level the playing field to the extent that they have to actually spend more money on this. I mean, it is wasteful, but maybe it's good for 
um, leveling the playing field and for competition. Requiring disclosures is another way to go about this, although in this context, in the context of software, just generally writ large, that might be um, too harsh of a remedy. There might be better ways, and I know some people have been working on this about sharing um, data, and that might be helpful. And I want to just underscore that I've been really thinking about this and talking about this from the context of um, innovation. I know so many of our discussions have been thinking about different values that are promoted by um, wanting to have a disclosure of data or models, and so civil liberties, due process, and I think those are quite important, but I think it's also important to think about um, the shape of innovation um, and, that, um, and whether trade secrets are going too far. I suspect the incentives to go for them are too strong, and that's hurting other people down the line, and um, while the solutions are not gonna be simple, I think we're going to have to be thinking about it in this space because of these new characteristics of the software industry. Thank you. Jeannie teed this up so beautifully by talking about wondering about where we might see innovation and whether this is going to be an attractive incentive. And the next two panelists are actually going to dive into parts of that question in deeper ways. Both Nicholson and Jonathan are going to look at the medical field as well as law enforcement algorithms in particular. And Nicholson is going to come and speak a little bit more about the role of chase secrecy, specifically in medical AI, like asking the important questions such as why is this attractive and why might these might be uh, some problematic incentives that we are concerned with, perhaps for innovation and perhaps for some of the other value reasons that have been surfaced throughout the conference. Love it, love it, awesome. Um, so thanks so much for having me here. Uh, I'm excited. Uh, th there's this weird feeling when you're at the beginning of the second day of the conference. You're like, do I just talk about what I thought I was going to talk about or do I try to do some grand synthesis on the fly of all the cool <laughs> things we heard about the first day? And it turns out the second one's really hard, so instead I'm just going to toss out some shout outs to things we heard about the first day and earlier today and we'll pretend like that's a grand synthesis. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about medical AI. Uh, Glenn talked a bunch about this general topic yesterday, so I'm not going to do any real background. Uh, I'm just excited uh, about the possibility of using artificial intelligence to improve medical care, whether that means uh, by uh, pushing the frontiers or by democratizing expertise or whatever it is that we think medical AI can do. And so the question is, uh, why do we need incentives at all for medical AI? And this, I think, reflects some of the issues that we've uh, talked about yesterday, but I, I want to just break it down. Like, why? What's the point of the incentives? Why don't we just think people should be creating uh, these goods on their own? As Jeannie mentioned, you know, the software industry flourished for a long time without much in the way of protection. Uh, what's different here, if anything? Uh, so I'd argue that a, that a couple of the goods that are at the basis of medical AI are pricey goods, in particular. Or uh, so. The big data that are used to train medicine are especially expensive to gather. The US health data system is a giant mess. Uh, as you know from, I'm sure you know from your own personal experience, patients bounce around from health system to health system, doctor to doctor, insurer to insurer, and your data don't tend to follow you particularly well. Instead, they're relatively trapped in non-interoperable systems. And in addition to just the technological challenge of the fact that data are trapped in all these different places, there are legal structures that make it hard to gather data in healthcare. So HIPAA uh, has a privacy rule that says, hey, it's, here are some ways in which it's tough to disclose or use uh, individually identifiable health data. But it's not just what HIPAA actually requires, right? Yesterday, David Lewine talked about the idea of opportunistic privacy where firms say, um, you know, we have to protect, we have to limit disclosure or limit sharing of data for the reasons of privacy, even if privacy reasons don't actually require them to limit this particular use or disclosure of data. And healthcare is an area where firms are really ready to say, actually, we're, we're totally going to keep this, we're not gonna share this with anybody at all, even with you, for instance, because we're so concerned about HIPAA and other privacy rules. So gathering data is hard, gathering data is expensive. Training algorithms, also expensive, right? But it turns out it's easier than it used to be, but the computers and the code, especially when you're trying to put together uh, machine learning algorithms that are using really vast amounts of data from different sources, that is also expensive. <coughs> And these are classic information goods, which is to say they're non-rivalrous, 
once the data are gathered, anybody can use them without decreasing the use of anybody else. They're not excludable, which is to say that once they are out there in the world, it's rather hard to keep other people from using them. And so these are classic information goods, and that's the story that says, oh, okay, we want some sort of an intellectual property protection because we're worried about free riding. But the classic like, intellectual protection that we tend to leap to in technological areas is patents. And so the question is, well, why don't patents work here in this super technological field of innovation? Patents haven't shown up a whole lot in this conference yet, and I wanna just chat for a moment about why not so much. <clears throat> Uh, well, for data, the answer is pretty simple, which is that patents aren't available for data uh, at all. There's, they're just, they just don't fit into any of the categories of things that you're allowed to patent, so patents are <coughs> off the table. Algorithms are a slightly more complicated story. For a while, it seemed like algorithms were pretty patentable, and then the Supreme Court in three cases between 2012 and 2014, really especially in 2012, uh, seems to say algorithms that are doing no more than discovering natural laws about the world or the way the world works and then basically applying that knowledge, those aren't patentable subject matter. Those aren't the sort of things that you can get a patent for. And the Supreme Court described this in a way that was broad enough to suggest that for lots of personalized <coughs> medicine, lots of medicine that results or that relies on finding relationships uh, between different proteins or different biomarkers, levels of a drug metabolite in the blood and dosing levels of the drug, these sorts of things are essentially not patentable, which seems to strike out lots of what you might think of as what medical AI can do. So trade secrecy fits much better. For algorithms, it's easy to keep algorithms secret. As Jeannie just mentioned, you can hide them in the cloud. In fact, there are reasons uh, it, based on the way FDA regulates algorithms to say it's maybe even better for you if you don't let your algorithms out into the world but instead just keep them locked away in one specific laboratory because if that's the case you encounter a lighter FDA scrutiny. And frequently, right, we don't know how these algorithms actually work which makes them a great candidate for secrecy because you can say, well, how would I describe this anyway? I don't know exactly how it works setting aside all the challenging bit about what I do know about how it was trained, how it was developed. Data are also really attractive to keep secret. Uh, keeping data in silos and proprietary is something that, again, opportunistic privacy says companies have an easy out. Of course I'm not gonna share your data. All I care about is protecting my patient's privacy. It's just a coincidence that that also happens to give me a rather hefty competitive edge. So the classic story here is Myriad Genetics. Myriad had for a long time a monopoly on testing for a predisposition to breast cancer based on mutations in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. It had that monopoly based on patents on the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. The Supreme Court in 2013 said, well, those patents aren't valid. You can't patent isolated DNA. And nonetheless, Myriad still has a huge market advantage because while it had that monopoly, it was the only game in town. And so it collected tremendous amounts of data about lots and lots of different women's mutations in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes and how that correlated with their medical history. And so it knew more variants and it understood the clinical significance of more variants than essentially anybody else in the world. It still has that advantage because it's the only one with those data. So trade secrecy turns out to be really exciting and really useful as a set of incentives, at least from the point of view of the firms in this area. It's easy and great to protect data. It's easy and great to protect algorithms. It's easy and great to protect the way that you develop algorithms. But you'll be unsurprised to know, I think that while firms might think that this is great, it ends up creating some real problems for the rest of us. I lump these vaguely into the boxes of kind of innovation, quality, and adoption. So on the innovation side of things, the challenge when data in particular are uh, siloed and kept proprietary as a result of this is we get smaller data sets and data sets that are limited in exactly what they cover. If Myriad keeps its own giant data set of breast cancer mutations uh, over here in its own silo, well that means whoever else is trying to figure out say a general predictive measure for cancer is missing a big chunk of what's going on. And 
as each individual health system keeps their own data siloed, we have a much harder time assembling data about individual patients uh, or the variation that's necessary to really make some of these models chug along quite well. Now, there are ways around this, as uh, Glenn has written, data triangulation is a thing where you say, okay, here's some de-identified data over here and some de-identified data over here and a little bit of identified data over here, and I'm gonna figure out a way to combine these three things and create a bigger record, but that also is going to end up creating barriers <coughs> to entry uh, for based on your capacity to do this uh, and just make it uh, harder for at least some firms to be involved in the market. For algorithms, secrecy is going to result, or is going to tend to result in challenges to cumulative innovation, which is to say, it's harder to know how you can improve somebody else's product if you have no idea what somebody else's product is. It's tough to learn from other players in the market. And sure, we have competition between different players that try to balance this out, but without some sort of disclosure, it's tough to know if you're duplicating somebody else's effort or taking another step forward. It's tough for the industry to learn from itself. A second set of problems is in quality. Uh, so it's tough to spot problems. It's tough to identify when algorithms are performing well or performing poorly, when data are high quality or low quality, when you can't actually see the algorithm, you can't see the data, and you can't see the validation. Uh, I wanna say Jen mentioned yesterday uh, DeWitt clauses, which are frequent clauses uh, in software contracts that prevent you who, who have adopted the software from discussing performance issues of the software or problems that you encounter. And so when you can't tell whether an algorithm is working, and if you can tell whether an algorithm is working, you can't tell anyone else, it makes it hard to say, yeah, this is a good product, this is something we should, in fact, should actually adopt. And when we're talking about medicine in particular, you'd really like to know if this is actually working since so much of health is a credence good, as Glenn pointed out yesterday. Maybe it's okay if the answer is the FDA can get access to these data. But if we think that FDA might not have the full capacity to do evaluations of changing algorithms all the time, if we think it's useful for independent third-party validation, as was also pointed out yesterday, to really have potentially an adversarial process and say, no, no, this is working, this isn't, and here's how I'm gonna test your system and show it, it's awfully hard to have that sort of independent third-party rigorous validation when everything is secret. Finally, trade secrecy, I think, also leads to potential adoption challenges, which is to say, when you're trying to sell a hospital on your new system, hey, look, here's how it diagnoses cancer better, we already have an inherent opacity to lots of forms of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Not all of them, but lots of them. And when trade secrecy as an incentive means, well, okay, I'll tell you that I have this algorithm, I'll tell you that it works, but for my own incentive reasons, I don't wanna tell you how we developed it, the data that we trained it on, and I certainly don't wanna share those with you. We run into a conflict between the desire for sales on the one side and the desire for an exclusivity incentive on the other side, and I'm not sure exactly how that's gonna end up playing out, but I see at least the potential for problems. So how might we think about solutions if we think that trade secrecy, or at least excessive trade secrecy here, is likely to be a problem? One possibility, and this answers a little bit of the concern Jeannie just raised, is the idea of forcing disclosure uh, through the regulatory process. This was also brought up yesterday, I don't remember by whom. So some black box medicine, some medical AI is going to end up going through the FDA approval process. We could say we're gonna condition that pre-market approval on the disclosure, either to FDA or perhaps more publicly, of the data and the training methods by which that algorithm were developed. We could say this is part of the deal, and this showed up a couple times yesterday, David Levine's talk about uh, kind of critical infrastructure. If you want to do something that has public facing good sides, you're going to need to disclose. And we can say, well look, healthcare is such a public facing good and we're going to require some disclosure. We could also imagine a way around trade secrecy by saying, hey, that hurdle that you need to overcome, that challenge of developing data in the first place and creating these big data sets, we're gonna take that off your plate. We can imagine a vision of the world where the government thinks, or we as a public, think about data 
for health or for something else as a sort of infrastructure for innovation where public, innov where public investment in high quality, broadly applicable data sets can provide a baseline upon which later innovation can take place rather than leaving that task to the private market to assemble those data. And in fact, there are some efforts along these lines already in health. The Precision Medicine Initiative has the All of Us cohort, which aims to gather health data on about a million Americans, widely representative across different racial and ethnic groups, different social economic uh, classes, and to make these data available for future innovation. <clears throat> Another model that I think is kind of interesting, uh, this was I think Glenn mentioned this about the idea of patient unions. Barbara Evans at Houston has talked about the idea of patients essentially gathering their own data as a set, as a, a group of patients, thousands, tens of thousands, millions, whatever, and saying, we're going to collect our own data as HIPAA gives you the right to do, and use those data and say, these are now available for certain types of innovation. This also provides at least the potential for patients to, to monetize their own data. Interesting possibility. These don't really prevent uh, trade secrecy, but they provide other alternatives. The last point I'll suggest, and on, on, on this I'll leave you, is the idea that it's worth a thought as to where we want firms to compete. What is the best locus of competition? And so for a lot of algorithms, I think medical in particular, the locus of competition has become who can gather the broadest proprietary data sets and keep them secret. But that, it turns out, has some pretty negative consequences, which I've spent the last few minutes describing. And we might imagine whether there's a better equilibrium where we have higher, right now we're in an equilibrium of relatively low disclosure. We might imagine whether there's a high <clears throat> disclosure equilibrium where the competitive advantage that is sought in this space is not provided by secrecy, but by something else. And a vision of that something else might be the idea of intense personalization and service. So it's just to say IBM and Google DeepMind and whoever else are not competing based on who has the biggest data set, but rather who can use a common data set of health information to tailor their algorithms to exactly what you want here at NYU's medical center or out in rural Idaho who provides that service best, who provides that tailoring best, rather than uh, competition far on the back end with those sorts of uh, problematic secrecy implications. So, thanks very much. Fantastic, this so beautifully tees up uh, what Jonathan is gonna come speak to all of you about, uh, about specifically a different type of field where this trade secrecy has a lot of negative impacts on other values that we care about, including transparency. So he'll be talking more specifically about law enforcement algorithms and the Freedom of Information Act, and specifically how those two things interplay with regards to the protections for trade secrets, both under the law and under FOIA, um, and how those end up structuring the incentives, not just for uh, protecting these trade secrets, but maybe can actually to pick up on some of the values that Jeannie and Nicholson have identified around innovation, opportunities for innovation around how can we actually find out more about the black box systems that are in some ways running our lives. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, you summarize exactly what I want to talk about. Uh, so I also want to thank uh, Kathy, Jeannie, and uh, Julia for inviting me and for bringing us all here. Um, and to uh, Nicole Arts and all the staff for making this possible. Um, thanks. Uh, so as Amanda suggested, I want to sort of shift our attention to public sector, back to public sector algorithms. Yesterday, we spoke quite a bit about how the government is putting algorithms to use in the criminal justice and law enforcement context, um, but also in other contexts like Medicaid, uh, determinations, teacher performance, Link NYC. And, uh, and I want to focus our attention specifically on a, on a set of tools that um, may be useful for getting transparency and vetting these sorts of public sector algorithms. The Freedom of Information Act and its state analogs. Every state has one. Uh, and the specific questions I want to explore is how and whether these transparency laws can be a useful means for vetting these kinds of algorithms, and uh, how FOIA may structure incentives uh, uh, with, of the government and with respect to com companies that are contracting with the government to provide these kinds of um, 
systems. So just to start with some examples, we've already talked about some of these, so I'm not going to spend too much time um, on this, but, uh, but there's lots of tools out there. These are some that I think are most interesting and problematic. So uh, we have risk scoring tools now that are used to determine detention, whether people are going to be um, in prison or not, uh, pretrial, sentencing, and parole. I've listed two of the most common. Um, we have crime prediction tools that are meant to predict where crime is going to occur geographically. Uh, and the, the goal here is to direct where police should be resourced, where they should be allocated. Um, Fedpol and Hunchlab are the two uh, dominant players in this space. Um, they work quite differently. Um, one is much more sophisticated than the other. One is much, and the more sophisticated one is much less transparent about how it works, Hunchlab. Um, uh, is much, it's much harder to pin down exactly what the algorithm is doing there. Um, and then maybe most troubling are these individual profiling tools that are meant to target probable offenders. This is where we get into the minority report territory. Um, and uh, maybe worth focusing on the LAPD's um, tool in this space. So, so we now know that they're working with Palantir, which is a company that originally started uh, doing work with the CIA and, and, and the military, to pull together data from all kinds of sources and uh, attempt to predict who was going to be a, quote, probable offender. And through FOIA requests, uh, a group in LA called the Stop the Spying Coalition, they obtained documents about this system that um, uh, included a checklist of how people were going to be put on lists to be subjects of um, uh, these, uh, uh, put on these lists of probable offenders, and also what police should then do with that information. So um, police are meant to do things like uh, send a letter telling you, oh, you're on this list. Uh, be, be, be aware you're likely to be getting some uh, extra attention. Um, to go knock on doors, ask questions, stop and frisk, um, field interviews, which means essentially interrogation on the streets, um, and then arresting if there's grounds to arrest, if there are warrants. So essentially, you're, if, you, if you're on this list, you're going to be having trouble with the law. Um, uh, and the only way to get off is not to have trouble with the law, and that's difficult if you're if you're subject to um, heightened scrutiny, shall we say. So, um, and the Chicago PD has a similar pro uh, program. We know less about how that one works even. There's litigation actually happening on the open records law in Chicago, um, in, in Illinois, to, to learn more. And DHS at the border, Customs and Border Protection, we, we now know because of some work Epic did, that they're also con they've also contracted with Palantir to um, identify apprehend and to, to use a tool that would that helps them identify, apprehend, and prosecute individuals who pose a potential law enforcement or security risk at the border. Um, we don't know much more of that, than that about how it works. So um, lots to worry about, I suppose. Um, again, we, I, I don't want to belabor the concerns here because we've talked about them yesterday, but, but some of the concerns are fami familiar with respect to um, problems internal to the algorithm problems about entrenching bias, feedback loops that can lead to um, uh, increasing disparities in, in the way that uh, people are policed, uh, a sense of false objectivity, uh, error. It's very difficult, as Rochelle suggested yesterday. Sometimes these tools may just not work very well, and it's very difficult to um, audit them, and often these tools aren't audited very carefully. Um, but I want to suggest that there's a couple, um, a few problems that are sort of unique to uh, the use of algorithms in the, in the governmental setting and in the law enforcement setting. Um, one has to do with secret policies. So these, so these kinds of algorithms, they embed policy judgments um, of uh, big and small, of various sorts. So um, with respect to predictive policing tools, uh, does the algorithm cut against, for example, community policing objectives that you might want to explore? Does it cut against um, a, a policy objective that would involve developing relationships between individual police officers that are working in a particular neighborhood and get to know people and build relationships of trust, as opposed to just deploying whichever police officer is closest or is on, on um, uh, it, the algorithm is sort of deciding it's going to be sent there. So, um, so there's a real concern about having secret policy judgments embedded in these algorithms. Um, closely related is a democracy problem. Um, if the, these policy judgments are not transparent, they're not subject to the sort of ordinary means of public oversight that we expect um, our public institutions to be subject to. Um, uh, legislatures, oversight um, bodies don't work very well if the public doesn't have information um, that, that, that's in order to 
engage those institutions. And then the last problem is, for, is, is what is the Kafka problem. I'm borrowing from Dan Solov here. Um, the idea is that people won't know, uh, people with respect to especially these minority report type systems, people um, may have no idea what information the government is using and how it's been using against them. Uh, from the perspective of an individual on a target list, uh, it probably feels uh, quite bewildering, arbitrary, um, you're subject to the whims of, of a sort of faceless, inscrutable decision maker that you can't really interact with. So what kinds of transparency do we want in this space? Again, I, I'm not going to go through each of these. Um, there's been terrific work done to think about the kinds of transparency that, that, that is helpful. So um, uh, Jason Schultz and his colleagues at AI Now um, have a very useful report um, that summarizes a lot of this. Uh, Nick Diakopoulos also. Uh, at Northwestern has done some important work uh, thinking about the kinds of transparency that we want in order to be able to properly vet these kinds of public sector algorithms. Um, uh, and I've off offered some more granular details here, but essentially we want to know first that the algorithm exists, and then second we need to know uh, how it works and how it's used. So FOIA, why focus on FOIA? So most people in the room already know, but basically FOIA is a law that allows you to request records and gives you a presumption, re requires the government to turn them over unless they fall within an exemption. Um, so why focus on FOIA? Yesterday we talked uh, quite a bit about protective orders, discovery in the criminal context, maybe discovery in, in the civil context where, where there's an affirmative challenge to the use of a predictive system. Um, the trouble is, is that many of these algorithmic systems will uh, Will, will not find their way into court um, otherwise. So uh, they will not produce evidence in a criminal case that can then be subject to testing um, or a suppression motion. Um, they will resist affirmative challenges. And that's often because, um, and especially with respect to algorithms that determine government resource allocations. So if, a, if an algorithm is not making an individualized determination, but instead just making a decision about where the government should allocate its resources, that's going to be quite difficult to mount a challenge to. It's going to be difficult to show that any individual or group of individuals are, uh, have standing or otherwise have a, have a claim. Um, it's also important to focus on FOIA, I think, because you need some amount of disclosure in order to identify potential violations if you want to uh, take things further. Um, I think it's instructive that all over the place, in this domain and others, investigative journalism usually comes first, and then the lawyers come in later. <laughs> um, and in a way, FOIA is the tool of investigative journalists. Um, it's, the, it's the tool that allows, it's the all-purpose transparency tool. You don't have to have a case in order to get trans disclosure. Um, another important feature of FOIA is that it's about disclosure to the public at large. It's not about disclosure to a, a limited group of people. So in that way, it can be particularly effective means to activate democratic institutions and sort of solve or help solve the democracy problem I mentioned before. Um, and then finally, it allows a much broader community of researchers, experts, and advocates to weigh in. So it's not just the lawyers for a particular client and the expert th that they've retained that's um, able to assess the system. It's a, it's a much broader community. And then just at a higher level, I mean, this is what FOIA was meant to do. <laughs> FOIA was meant to, uh, the whole purpose of FOIA is for the public to be able to audit the government, um, to be able to understand what the government is up to. Um, so in an early FOIA case, the Supreme Court says the basic purpose of the Freedom of Information Act is to open agency action to the light of public scrutiny. And then here in New York, we actually the preamble, preambles aren't worth much, but, <laughs> but, uh, but no nonetheless, the preamble to the New York Freedom of Information Law is even, even more on point to these issues. The people's right to know the process of governmental decision making and to review the documents and statistics leading to determinations is basic to our society. Access to such information should not be thwarted by shrouding it with the cloak of secrecy or confidentiality. Powerful words, right? Um, what does it mean in practice? So there, there are problems. FOIA is obviously not a um, panacea here. So uh, the first I've already mentioned, FOIA is one size fits all. You can't, go, you can't file a FOIA request and um, ask the judge to impose restrictions that would balance um, disclosure to a certain segment of the public against the, the um, company's trade secrecy interests. So uh, you can't tailor disclosure. If you win a FOIA case, you essentially eviscerate whatever trade secrecy uh, claims 
existed. <laughs> if, there, if there were trade secrecy claims, they, they no longer exist. Um, so it's a real battle. It's a contest between whether the trade secret, secret claim exists or not. It's not, uh, it, there's no intermediate steps here. Um, the second has to do with the exemption. So as you can imagine, FOIA, as I, as I said before, FOIA gives you a right to ask for anything. The government has to turn it over unless it falls within an exemption. And as, you can, as you'd expect, there is a trade secrecy exemption under um, essentially every transparency law in the country. Uh, that said, there is significant variation, and I think this is sort of an interesting point. There's significant variation in the way that the trade secrecy exemptions are implemented in all of these laws. So uh, at the federal level, um, the DC circuit and a bunch of other circuits that followed it has rejected the modern capacious definition of trade secrecy. Um, it has rejected the idea that all you need to show is that information would be commercially valuable if disclosed. Um, it requires uh, a link to a productive process. It has to be tied to making stuff. So uh, a, a secret commercially valuable plant, formula, process, or device that is used for making, et cetera, trade commodities, and that can be said to be the end product of either innovation or substantial effort. So this is a significantly narrower, it's a much older and narrower definition of what a trade secret is. And, and the court adopts this older and narrower definition explicitly because the purpose of FOIA is public disclosure. And if you had the very capacious notion of trade secrecy, all kinds of things would be a trade secret. It would, it would swallow up lots of FOIA. Uh, that said, under FOIA, there's also another category of information that's exempt, which is confidential commercial information. Um, and this gets closer, it's, it's a little bit broader, it gets closer to the modern trade secrecy conception, but, but not, uh, it's not con con contiguous. So. Um, the government can withhold information only if it would first impair the government's ability to obtain information. So it's not about the company's interests. Or if it would cause substantial harm to the competitive position of the person from whom imp information was, was obtained. And note two important differences with um, other trade secrecy doctrines. It requires a showing of actual harm, not the mere possibility of harm. Um, and it requires substantial harm, not just some <laughs> modicum. So if there, if there are, for example, if there are no competitors in the space, there's no trade secret, even if in the future there could be, potentially. Um, so uh, I've begun to, so this is still work in progress, but I've begun to canvas all the states to see if there's anything interesting going on at the state level. And it turns out there is. So um, in uh, Washington, they've essentially adopted the Uniform Trade Secrets Act definition of trade secrecy. But um, what the court has done is they've said that if a company wants to come into a case to oppose disclosure, they have to show that secrecy is in the public interest under the sort of ordinary um, standards for getting an injunction. So, so uh, it's, it's, not, it's not enough just to show that it's a trade secret. They have to show that an injunction against disclosure is, is serves the public interest. Um, uh, in California, the trade secrecy exemption is incorporated through an evidentiary privilege for trade secrecy, which itself is qualified. So in California, um, the, the privilege or exemption can be defeated if um, the allowance of trade secrecy protection will tend to conceal fraud or otherwise work injustice. And if you're a clever lawyer, you can imagine lots of arguments about why trade secrecy might work injustice in certain circumstances. So there's opportunities to make arguments um, that aren't available in other trade secrecy contexts. Um, Florida has an interesting uh, approach. They, they have the capacious trade secret definition, but um, they require agencies to designate stuff as a trade secret up front, or they lose the protection on the theory that if you don't designate the trade secrets, uh, mark them, mark, mark the documents that are trade secrets, it's a failure to take reasonable steps to protect your trade secrecy um, if you just turn them over to the government. So, so there's interesting opportunities to um, look at state laws as a way to uh, get access to information that might otherwise be subject to, to trade secrecy. Um, as I've suggested, some of these have to do with the idea of a public interest override or public interest balancing. Um, there's really interesting uh, litigation happening right now. I, I'm not sure if she, the, the folks at the Media Freedom Clinic at Yale are litigating um, exactly this question, uh, uh, Jennifer Pinsoff, Court Caddy, um, oh, there she is. Uh, they're, they're, they're making really clever arguments about why there should be a public interest balancing even at the federal level. Um, so there's, there's interesting uh, developments potentially on the horizon.
so other other problems. Um, you know, one other problem is is that FOIA only gives you access to information that the government has. So does the government even have the information? Um, the the truth is is that a FOIA request often reveals how little the government knows about the algorithms that it's using. Uh, so you'll often find that there is no validation study. The government has no validation study in their in its possession, uh, even though it's using uh, an algorithm. That that itself is actually newsworthy and troubling. Um, so it's worth filing the request to find that out. Um, but but very commonly, agencies don't have things like training data, source uh, source codes, details about how the model works. Um, and this is where you know the the question of um, incentives becomes most acute. So the greater the risk of disclosure pursuant to FOIA, the more companies are going to be reluctant to disclose information to the government. So you could have a paradoxical situation where you increase the theoretical possibility of transparency, but it, you end up with a situation where the government actually knows even less about the systems that it's operating, which in turn means that who's, who's making deci the policy decisions, who's, who's responsible for the secret policy judgments, it's the vendor. So we're, we're further outsourcing um, policy judgments to the sort of, to the vendor and, and, and making those decisions to the procurement process. Um, I, think, I think it's worth, um, well, just to, I mean, companies are onto this. So this is something I found online. This isn't an algorithmic, uh, this isn't a company that sells ag algorithmic systems, but um, this, this is advice that was given to, uh, by a trade association that actually sells, uh, they, they run helicopter tours Oddly enough, but here, but but here's the advice that was given: um, Do not gratuitously provide information, uh, more information than the federal agency you are working with asks for. <laughs> Work to rule, basically. Uh, get the information back. If they don't have it, they can't disclose it. So I I suspect that um, we we have to think hard about how uh, these incentives interact with weakening trade secrecy protection under FOIA, and whether we need disclosure mandates. Um, to the government in order to make, uh, make the system work. Um, and then, uh, you know, final set of challenges is that FOIA doesn't cover everything. For, FOIA was um, enacted in an era where computers weren't really making decisions very frequently. Um, what you wanted, what you needed access to were documents, records, maybe you had to see the decision maker, ha um, uh, you had to sort of have access to the meeting or, or the, the proceeding. but. Um, but it only covers records, which means it often doesn't cover the executable. You can't actually use FOIA to get access to the system and run your test data through it and audit it that way. Um, uh, there's been proposals to amend FOIA. Uh, uh, again, uh, Nicholas Diakopoulos talks about a Freedom of Information Processing Act. Um, the idea would be to give people a right to basically play with the system and audit, audit the system. Um, so I just want to finish by providing uh, just a couple thoughts about ways to, to use FOIA. Um, one, the first is just take advantage of the sort of haphazard, uh, decentralized nature of FOIA. So, so if you're looking into a particular tool, you can file requests everywhere it's been used. Every state and local agency that uses a tool is its own FOIA universe. And they are not uniform in how they treat these requests. So, uh, results will vary, and you only need to crack the nut once to get useful information. Um, in the interest of time, I won't get into details here. Uh, uh, there's, there's useful examples of, uh, you know, these two authors here, Brownies and Goodman, they did a study and um, uh, sent FOIA requests to six jurisdictions about Hunch Lab, got essentially no information from five, got a lot from the sixth, which, Lincoln, Nebraska, which actually prompted the manufacturer of Hunch Lab to write a report, a long report, uh, a citizen's guide to Hunch Lab, kind of addressing the problems that you, one might have imagined, um, uh, the questions one have imagined asking that came out of that disclosure. So um, it's an example of where just a, a FOIA didn't just get information out of the government, but actually prompted more disclosure from the company. Um, the other idea is to focus on jurisdictions, do some forum shopping, focus on jurisdictions with weak, weak exemptions. Um, there are strategic litigation opportunities here. Uh, there's, more, there's more to talk about in the solution space, but again, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop there and uh, look forward to the discussion. Maybe we can get into that then. Thank you.
Oh, sorry, sure. Can you put that back? Of course. <laughs> Just so people can start thinking about strategic litigation opportunities in favorable jurisdictions. <laughs> Um, before, one of the nice things about being a moderator is that when you are excited about all the panelists, you have the privilege of getting to reserve the first question for yourself, which is what I'm about to do. And then I'll turn it over to all of you for Q&A. And I think what we'll have people do is I'll pull this mic out and we can just kind of have people line up in order here and you can just pass it back as people move through. Is that okay? Amazing. So um, I wanted to draw together one of the themes that emerged from all of the, the things that your different presentations touched on about this question. Obviously, this is a focus about incentives, but all of you talked a little bit about innovation in different ways, right? Whether this is a way to actually go around innovation, is this a way to protect your innovation, is this a way that's actually going to stifle innovation in other fields? And to Jonathan's point, is it a way that we can actually innovate in our ways to get at the actual trade secrecy um, in sort of like a meta level. Um, and one of my questions was, the attraction here is, is sort of, as Nicholson pointed out, that patents seem like they could do some of this work, right? And Jeannie, also you got at this point as well by talking about how the software industry did previously flourish without this kind of protectionist lockdown modality. And one of my questions for sort of all of you before we open it up to everyone broadly is, the secrecy and trade secrecy is really doing a lot of work, right? They're, these companies aren't just concerned, as we've talked about through Jonathan's notes about how FOIA exemptions and recommendations to people about how they disclose their work. There's a concern that some of this stuff is really creepy or really dangerous or scary, and that's why the secrecy piece is so attractive. So I would love to hear from each of you how you think the desire to, the, the attractiveness of the opacity is actually the whole driving measure, and there's not a lot we can do potentially about that piece of it as long as some of these use applications are potentially going to be seen by the public as creepy and dangerous. Maybe Jonathan, I'll start with you since you've done some of this FOIA work. Yeah, um, I mean, I think so. Par I think part of the answer here has to do with looking closely at the particular system um, in question, right? So, sort of like Kathy and Eli, uh, and I forget the name of their third co-author. I'm sorry, <laughs> Nick. Um, uh, have done. They've looked at you know, the algorithm systems in that particular context and trying to make, and are making the case that, in fact, um, this shouldn't be trade secret at all. And I think there might be similar kinds of work to do with respect to many of these law enforcement or government algorithms where, where, where you can show that, in fact, the, the incentives for innovation don't require um, trade, trade secrecy. Um, I think there's also sort of a more sort of foundational question about whether we think there should be trade secrets at all when um, a system is being used to provision public services. Um, and uh, uh, th there's a sort of a deep tension between the idea that uh, we're going to have commercial secrecy uh, preventing the public from understanding how the government is going about um, uh, implementing policy. Uh, so uh, y you could imagine a proposal where we just don't have a trade secrets exemption, or we have a categorical exclusion where um, algorithmic systems are implementing a public function, they're serving sort of a public function. Uh, I think that uh, that's ambitious, but uh, maybe something to work towards in the future. Yeah, if, if I could just add something here, I think uh, it's a really interesting question and way to think about it. And I think, you know, that just underscores um, exactly the point of why, in some contexts, not all the contexts, um, secrecy may be exactly, there may be this, you know, public mm -hmm. interest, really heightened public interest in knowing. I mean, I think about other contexts about, so what are the things that are often kept secret by trade secret and that work? Processes, right? You don't know how something is made or you don't know what's behind the point where someone gets to a product that gets onto the market necessarily. And in those contexts, we've seen so much public agitation around certain things. So let's say the way cosmetics are tested on animals. You didn't have to see that to get the cosmetic, right? Yeah. Or um, the labor practices that go into producing um, products that we all mm -hmm. buy. And those are things that are somewhat easier to keep secret, but the public really cares about it and gets very worked up about it. And I think that's the point, is that there are 
because it's creepy, because it may be part of the way the government provides its services, in some contexts, the public ought to know and be making that decision. I get why the business would want to keep it secret, <laughs> because it is creepy, but that also <laughs> underscores that there is a public interest in disclosing it. I don't know that this cuts across the board, right, about everything, but I think particularly where there's this countervailing interest, then um, there ought to be some mechanism. Yeah, and in, in the medical context, I imagine that that's even more complicated, so yeah. I would love to yeah, hear. So the, the question that I wonder here, the, the question that keeps coming out for me is, well, you don't have to let companies keep things secret, right? They're selling you things, mm -hmm. or you, for some broad definition of you, right? They're selling things. That's a contract. It's possible people could, like the government could say, mm -hmm. I'm willing to use your service. You have to disclose what happens. Mm -hmm. It's right. possible a hospital could say, we're going to use your algorithm. Part of the condition of us buying your algorithm is you have to share the data so that it's available for independent third party validation. We don't do that like, lots of the time, which is weird to me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because it, the question is like, why doesn't contract and desire deal with this? The answer might be nobody actually cares, yeah. um, which I find possible but troubling. The answer might also be this kind of talismanic woo-woo innovation, um, <laughs> and oh, we need the secrecy because otherwise we won't be able to compete. Which I think is potentially a role for kind of the conversations in this room to say that's bogus. Like, here are the situations in which trade secrecy really is necessary to provide the in incentive because there's nothing else. But if we're talking about a situation, like Jeannie talked about, like, look, the software industry can do just fine without wildly strong trade secrecy protection. I think the same thing is going to happen in medicine, especially if we take steps in other directions to make the innovation cheaper or easier. And so I think part of our role is to kind of pop that bubble that trade secrecy is magic, so maybe we're more willing as consumers whether through the government or health systems or just buying stuff, um, to, to actually demand disclosure. Amazing. Well, with that, So what I'm hearing is that we need like an Upton Sinclair to show us how this exact type of algorithmic sausage gets made, and with that beautiful image. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you for these talks. My questions are, my question is based on something Nicholson said, but I'd like to hear what Nicholson and Jeannie say, think about this. I'm thinking about the connection between um, trade secrecy and trust in technology. So Nicholson, one of the things that you said is that there's an adoption problem because we don't know, we trade, a strong form of trade secrecy doesn't allow us to know anything about it and that means that people might be less likely to adopt or use the technology. And I'm not so sure about that and I wonder what you feel. There's a long literature in trust in technology and I'm doing some empirical work on this that seems to suggest that People tend to trust the technology as like some kind of magic. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it works perfectly, it's a machine, it's kind of better than humans. And that when you give people information about the supply chain, like other, like uh, you might in a consumer context, which may improve willingness to uh, buy the product if you know where it came from and how much, how much uh, the workers were paid, et cetera, they would more, more likely adopt it. It's not true in the technology context. So, Again, going back to my is transparency and consent kind of garbage, is transparency more, uh, more transparency about algorithms not helpful in uh, eroding the kind of blind faith trust that we have in technology? Or what is the relationship between trust in technology which inspires adoption and trade secrecy which you think may erode adoption? Yeah, so it's a really interesting question. Uh, I, I think perhaps my, my statement might be more hopeful than realistic, which is to say I think that keeping everything secret should impair adoption, uh, but maybe that it won't. Uh, healthcare in particular, you know, it's the area where it's, as, as, as we mentioned, it's a credence good. If I get sick and I take a drug and I get better, I might have gotten better because of the drug or I might have gotten better anyway, or heck, I might have gotten better faster if I hadn't taken the drug and the drug actually made things worse. It's hard to know. And so what we would like is to know how well things work so that we know what we should do and what technologies we should adopt and we don't. Now, you may be right that we don't actually care about that when we make the decisions, which is depressing. Um, 
I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, I'll just add, I mean, I'm thinking about the, your Wizard of Oz invocation yesterday, and I do think there's something that people don't want to see behind the curtain um, and like to know what it, you know, think that this is magical and works magically. But at the same time, I guess I have this sense that if you tell people, right, that this factor is going into a decision, right, whether your parents were, um, were had criminal charges against them is going to affect your risk assessment. Um, yeah, that breaks some magic, <laughs> but in a way that we might want magic to be broken and, and that can be restored, right? So, you know, you, if you can realign how things are built, um, then there can be a new magic, right? But one that we could feel better about as a society. So I, I don't know, I mean, it's somewhat of an empirical question, 100%, but I still think I'm okay breaking the ma magic to some extent. Can, can I just make one comment? So, so I, think, I think your question points to something kind of deep about how transparency often breeds skepticism. Um, transparency doesn't necessarily build trust, it, it breeds, Skepticism. So David Posen has a great article mm -hmm. that just was published about how um, FOIA may actually be responsible in part for the distrust in government and the sort of anti-government um, politics that we see, and it's used as a tool to discredit government and, and make people um, uh, skeptical. And there's less transparency about companies, and so we're less skeptical at companies, maybe as a result. Um, and so I think in this domain, if we think that maybe it's a good idea to think less magically about algorithms, that transparency actually might be a really useful antidote. Yeah. So I have a, I guess a general question, and, um, and I, I should say that I'm a relative latecomer to all of this, so I apologize if this has been hashed out, but I haven't seen it. Um, so, you know, what I see, it, all of this conversation seems sort of vaguely dissatisfying to me, and it's not that I could do better, it's just that it seems like something is missing. And, um, and so what I, I mean, it seems like, you know, Jeannie and other people yesterday talked about how trade secret doesn't work in this context. Um, in my area of competition law, uh, litigation burdens of proof and procedures don't really work well, as Scott Hempel argued yesterday. Um, Jonathan says discovery maybe should be substituted with FOIA in some of these contexts. And is there an area of law that does work well here is what I'm wondering. And so I, I go back mm -hmm. to Kathy's response to Glenn's question yesterday, which is, you know, we have hundreds of years of thinking about how humans do things, and so maybe we should apply those to algorithms. But <laughs> I'm not sure that that's true. I mean, we have, you know, when I think of talking to students about this, it's so clear to me, which I, we can use as examples of lawmakers or judges, I guess, maybe. They, they just don't understand what's easy and what's hard in the algorithmic context in a way that they do understand what's easy and hard for human beings. And so what it makes me wonder is, you know, maybe our hundreds of years that have developed a particular body of law just don't make sense anymore, it generally, not just in particularly in trade secrets or stuff. And so, um, you know, I don't know what that means in the short term, um, but, it, but it seems like maybe what we're doing here is more tinkering around the edges and we need to be, think about more fundamentally different approaches to handling the whole legal groundwork um, than we've done. So if you four could just tell us what that framework so, is, that would be great. So, so, what I'm, so what I'm hearing from your question, so right, is thoughts about how to rearrange the legal system in our new yeah. algorithmic world. Go. Thoughts? <laughs> Great. Um, so I'm about to explain how to fix it. No. <laughs> so so I, I mean, I think there's other models that are out there, right? So um, the other regulatory models that might be more useful in this space. So I think that, um, like I mentioned, FOIA is a brittle tool. Disclosure, it's to everybody or to nobody. I think that maybe we want to think about walled garden approaches or having, you know, um, groups, researchers who are kind of independent and accredited get access to the information they need in order to conduct independent research. Um, uh, and, and that might be a useful way to sort of do this kind of auditing while respecting the trade secrecy concerns that might be implicated. Um, uh, you know, there's been suggestions that what we need is like an FDA type uh, regulatory scheme where you can't deploy an algorithm without, uh, you know, approval. I think that might be Quite difficult in this space, but but I, you know we, we do have lots of different regulatory um, uh, models that are lying around in all kinds of agencies, and I, you know I'm sure that some of those can be repurposed usefully. And I, I'm, I'm I don't have the magic bullet, but 
Yeah, I was just going to add, I mean, I think back um, to um, my former life uh, working in like machine learning, artificial intelligence um, back in the, like the dark ages. Um, and, um, you know, people weren't thinking about this issue. People were just thinking about what, how do you get the best result? I think there's still some of that thinking and I think that's part of the problem. And I see certain um, you see people outside of that space or near that space worrying. Um, but I think some of the most interesting work that's going on is also within um, computer science right now. So I think about work like um, at Penn, you've got um, uh, Michael Kearns and um, Aaron Roth that, that are doing, they're, they're creating new machine learning algorithms where you could set fairness as a parameter in it and um, trade off, realizing you trade off, let's say, accuracy for fairness, but that it's built in to what you're doing. And I think it's going to be, um, take work within the community, because that surfaces. What I, I think is like really um, wonderful about work like that, even if it's not exactly the right answer per se, let's say, mm -hmm. is that it surfaces that there's an issue and it says we're going to have to set this within um, the algorithm and it allows lawmakers, policy makers, interested um, um, entities to actually have a discussion about those trade-offs and say we, we want to set this. Um, and we're willing to trade off accuracy to this extent for um, fairness concerns. And I think that's where it's going to need to go to some extent to have a more comprehensive solution. So I'm going to respond with a, a bit of a meta kind of question back. Um, I guess it's not really a question back. So is this is. <laughs> yes, it's, it's more of a comment. Um, so this is not the first time that the issue has come up. Uh, here's this new technology that's reshaping the world, surely law can't respond to it and we have to reshape law because law can't adopt. Um, and it's turned out that that hasn't been super true in the past and I, I don't know how to know whether it's true now in a way that it hasn't been true in the past. My suspicion is that whenever we have some new technological chunk of stuff coming down the pipeline, um, the reaction is everything's different now and law can't possibly react. And it turns out it has, to greater or lesser, more or less successful extent. And I just don't know how to know if this is really different, or if this is a situation where tinkering around the edges will actually gradually cover most of the space that we need to cover. I don't know how to know that. Um, so I'm now gonna expose the fact that I'm not a real IP person, I just hang out with really smart IP person, so I can sometimes <laughs> sound like an IP person. And that is with this proposal for a congressional statute I've just invented and I want you to react to. It's called the <laughs> EASA, End Algorithmic Secrecy Act. Uh, sub, sub, sub part A says, uh, Section 101 of the Patent Act shall be amended to indicate that algorithms are patentable subject matter. Subsection B says, uh, all federal trade secrecy and all trade, uh, state trade secrecy law shall be amended to understand that algorithms are not subject to trade secrecy. Would it be better to live in a world under the EASA or the current world? And I'll tell you where this is coming from. Nicholson, when you said, um, you know, what we could do would be to have a requirement that you get FDA approval, you have to disclose all this publicly. That essentially is recreating patents in some kind of indirect way for medical products and that you're giving market exclusivity in return for disclosure. Not exactly lining up. But if you thought that was the right way to go, part of me wondered why not just reverse the Section 101 jurisprudence? So I'll give a wonky patent professory answer first, um, which is to say Section 101 isn't the whole problem, although it is the only problem that I mentioned. There are also Section 112 challenges. Um, section 112 basically says to get a patent, you have to describe the invention that you've come up with, and you have to enable the fazita, the person having ordinary skill in the art to make and use the invention. Turns out this is tough to do with uh, certain types of algorithms. It's relatively easy to do if you claim something very narrowly, but that makes it easy to invent around. It's relatively hard to do if you're claiming something broadly, but that's the only way that your patent's worth a whole lot. So I'm a little skeptical that patents are going to solve the problem for us, even if we set aside the fact that reversing these one-on-one -on -one decisions um, creates another kettle of fish problems. Yeah, and I was just going to say, it's still, I think we're still a little too early in seeing how the courts, how everything's going to shake out 
in patent law uh, on Section 101, not to mention, I think, the huge, I mean, there was a, uh, a big 112 um, decision, was it yesterday or something, on, in the McRow case, right, where... Yes, um, I obviously read that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you should have, and you should have... Everyone was so out. busy enjoying the wonderfulness yeah. of yesterday's yeah. first day of the conference. Yeah, they didn't read no, it. but I, mean, I think that um, the point being is that um, while the Supreme Court has issued some general guidance being skeptical on um, algorithms, uh, the Federal Circuit, I think, has rightly um, seen that there's nuance. There are different types of algorithms out there and the contributions that they make. And um, some of them are more within the realm of mainstream patent jurisprudence. So I think there's going to be um, some shaking out in the context. The worry is, and Nicholson, I think, has written about this beautifully, is about the um, ways in which patents and trade secrets um, complement and reinforce each other. Because you could get a patent on something, but you could keep some information to yourself. And um, in some ways, the solution you're proposing gets at some of that, saying, choose. <laughs> Right, you can't have both. It's just so hard to um, undermine trade secrets without inf without requiring disclosure as well. That's the, I think, the hardest aspect of this. You know, in other areas of law, we just say there's this law or there's not this law. But here, it's not. It doesn't actually yeah. do as much work to say no trade secret. Right. Saying. If you make trade secrecy go away, you're just removing the trade from secrecy, yeah. and companies can still use that. One quick additional complication before we jump to more questions, because I want to get more questions from all of you, is even if we were to change how the patent and trade secret sort of incentives re interact with the algorithmic problem, Nicholson already alluded to this challenge of the data sets and their proprietariness. And to me, I do research in how copyright in data, like images that are used in data sets can bias those algorithms because only the big players, as we were talking about yesterday with competition, are going to be able to meaningfully assemble those enormous data sets that are currently sort of the, the data du jour of how we train these systems. And so to me, that's also part of this trade secrecy challenge, which is even if you get the code, if the problem, the sort of problem of bias or the problem of transparency is deeply embedded in not knowing what the data is, this is still not necessarily going to get us there. Yeah. So I have a comment and a question. The comment is um, in response to Nicholson's observation that we could be using kind of contract or a procurement ways of, of opening things up. You know, I think you see a model of that a little bit in the criminal justice space because the two probabilistic genotyping systems, StarMix and True Allele, one is very closed, True Allele, and one has, you know, re revealed, will agree to reveal source code to the defense and so forth. And so under protection. But, um, and you see that, you know, functioning to actually drive both competition because now True Allele has kind of a backward flank move where Star Mix becomes the preferred vendor for criminal justice agencies because they don't have to deal with this question of transparency and True Allele for multiple reasons, but that was in part what drove them losing the New York contract. Um, and so I think there's a kind of competitive angle to disclosure as well and I think that we see your, your sort of supposition working at least in one space potentially. Um, the question is actually for Jonathan, and it's fairly narrow, but I would have thought in the surveillance area that the criminal, the law enforcement exemption would have been a major hurdle for uh, all of FOIA, even if you got past trade secrets, and I just wondered why that didn't come up. So, um, yes, and uh, you could read more about it in the paper that I just, I'm publishing. No, no, no. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Synergy. So, so I have, so, so you're absolutely right. So, so there are other exemptions under FOIA, and one of them is for law enforcement methods and techniques. Um, the idea is that um, the, gov the government won't disclose information that would allow you to circumvent um, its methods and techniques. And uh, there's th that that is at least as much of a problem as all of this. And happy to talk about that more. Yeah. <laughs> There was an other exemptions dot dot dot. <laughs> yeah, I have another narrow FOIA question for Jonathan. Um, so the the Sarepta case that we're bringing up, Mafia, that raises the public interest balancing, actually goes towards. So exemption four has two parts: it's confidential commercial information and trade secrets, mm -hmm. and it goes towards the confidential commercial information part. And the reason we did that is because we think it's harder to get a public interest balancing test for trade secrets for multiple reasons, but the main reason being that there's the, a law that m makes it a federal crime to reveal trade tickets. And I, I'm trying to come up with a case where we can bring public interest balancing to the trade secrets part of the exemption, mm -hmm. but that, do you, have you thought about how to get? I think that's very difficult. I mean, that, that, that might be a, a, 
I don't, I don't have a, a theory about um, how to get around that. I mean, there, there was an amendment to FOIA that now requires agencies, they can only withhold information if the harm is reasonably foreseeable. You know, so there might be some kind of argument that you, you could make that um, the agency has to show that the kinds of trade secrets, the kinds of harms that trade secrecy is meant to protect against is reasonably foreseeable, but I, I don't think that gets you a public interest balancing test. And you're right, there is the statute that makes it a crime for government agencies, government officials to disclose trade secrets and the way that that interacts with this sort of narrow definition of trade secrets is, is very tricky. So. Um, the, the, the one, one point to make, though, is that federal people tend to focus on the federal FOIA, um, but a lot of this stuff is happening at the state and local level. Most of these algorithms are being implemented at the state and local level, and it's a much messier and murkier picture. So I think it's, it's just as important to sort of think about interesting strategic litigation opportunities at the state level, um, which is starting to happen, I think. So. Uh, I think we have room for one more question, especially from one of our, oh, two more questions? Okay, we have two more questions. Go, yes. Um, I'll save my FOIA one. Uh, Nicholson, I have to pick up on the, it seemed like there was this sort of trend with a lot of the medical innovation that you always are just gonna want more data and that there'll be, which I think is, there are some innovations where that's the case. Um, the, the tricky thing, I think there's this sort of um, rapid emergence of a consensus that, well, we, for machine learning purposes, are going to need access to ever larger data sets and I just, have to put back then when you have the innovation point about personalization, where in any of it does patient confidentiality come in, if at all? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, I am less strong on the privacy side of things than many of my colleagues, by, by which I mean I, am, I prioritize that less. I tend to think about this as a grand social bargain where we think about benefiting from the health system and overall improved care and part of our contribution of that is that we are members in a learning health system that's constantly learning and improving if we don't think it's problematic that say doctors learn from our own experience and use that to help tra treat the next patient down the road maybe we can generalize that to say that the health system learning from our own experience and using that to treat for their patients down the road like that's have kind of our part of the bargain. Now, I recognize that that has some problems with it, including, for instance, the fact that huge numbers of people get minimal benefit out of the health system and we don't actually provide health care for lots of people, so this bargain is easier to imagine in, say, a country with universal health care, um, all of which is a set of issues that I push off onto my colleagues that are more on the privacy side of things. But I, I, I'm for, like, Let's bring the data together. I tend to focus on preventing consequentialist harms downstream rather than limiting data collection upstream. Um, I tend to think most of the data is they're, they're out there anyway. Uh, and the question of linking them together is more of a problem and making more equitable access to this. But I recognize that it's a, I, you're shaking your head. I, <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. I am for I am not for no limits. I am for some <laughs> limits. Uh, I think there are challenges in terms of saying like some people's out, data are out there already. Some people's aren't. The existence of which data are out there and for which people is likely to create bias in the system in terms of how algorithms are trained, what they're able to do better at, what they're not able to do better at. As Glenn pointed out yesterday, I don't think it's an obvious answer whom those biases benefit or prejudice, um, I'm not sure how to resolve that knotty tangle of issues. Unsatisfying, I know. Yeah, one more question. Do we have time? We sure do. Great. We always have time for questions <laughs> from students. Uh, I'm an optimist, and this might be a bit naive, but I am curious as to how you think we might be able to change the default rules. So I think each of you sort of discussed in various ways that the default right now is no. Um, so Professor Firmer, you talked about you know sort of need versus want, and when things are secret, you don't really have to address that distinction very much. Um, 
we talked about, I believe you called it the talismanic uh, <laughs> innovation argument. Um, and I think the entire FOIA process is a pretty big symbol of the fact that the default is no. Um, but how do we get people to sort of change that instinct um, and turn more towards you know, the, the, the same reasons why the open source software movement sort of started, but this desire to, to share as much as possible while maintaining your business needs. So how do we sort of shift that discussion? Yeah, give me, since we're short on time, I wanna make sure that I'm not, I don't wanna have all of us be the reasons people are held between their breaks, but give like your one line pitch on like, how do we change this? So. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually optimistic, and I think that it's a collective action problem, or at least it's potentially a collective action problem more than it is a problem of like straight up incentives. I know this, this is not one in line, sorry. Okay. Uh, I sat in a discussion of people about manufacturing biologic drugs where there's strong incentives to keep things secret because, oh, that's gonna keep your own drug mm -hmm. special and make other people, make it hard for other people to make it. But the executives that I were talking to said, it would be a better situation for all of us if we didn't keep things secret because then we would know what the heck was going on and how this stuff actually worked. And the problem was it's no, to no one's incentive to move to that high disclosure equilibrium on their own, because then they get hammered in the market. And so I'm somewhat optimistic that the burden for shifting from one equilibrium to another equilibrium might be lower than we think, because actually the other equilibrium might be better for everybody. That may just be naivete on my part as well. Yeah, I'll say ditto just on that. So. <laughs> yeah. and, and I guess with respect to public sector algorithms, I think that, um, you know, hopefully as policymakers get more sophisticated, they'll realize that it's a good idea not just to rely on the expertise of the vendor. This isn't like buying um, ordinary tables and chairs. Like, it's not, it's not uh, you shouldn't just rely on the expertise of the vendor to audit and um, vet these tools. And that it's valuable, very valuable, to have the information so that even if it's not the agency, other people can independently audit and vet um, these, these algorithms. And that that's actually in the interest of the governmental agency so that they're not caught flat-footed when it turns out things are going, going wrong. So. Yeah. Um, I have like a 30 minute or hour, two hour comment on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, you know that's always what I'm looking for at the end of a panel, so that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. But, uh, so just what, to, but just one response to that particular one, which is I think one possibility that has come through with some of the talks earlier and that you guys are talking about today is that um, there is a bit of a market for lemons problem here, mm -hmm. yeah. where you might think that if you are selling a really good product, um, you might have incentives to try to explain why you have a good car. Now, the flip side of that is that if you are some company, I won't name, that has like, all the data, then you can sell lemons because no one else has the data. But at least I think there are some incentives, if we wanted to do it regulatory or whatever, for companies that want to compete in, this, in these spaces, to be wanting to Exposed to lemons. On that on that sour but very sweet note, in some ways. Um, <laughs> thank you all for being much, such wonderful panelists. Thank you to Kathy, Rochelle, and Julia for inviting all of these lovely people here. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.